Hey, it's Kara and Kella. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Bitties. This is the drink as you learn wine school with two longtime friends. And sometimes two Boozy Bitties. We welcome two new wine studs today, Josh Osteen and Todd Gesselman for our episode on home winemaking. Hello, cheers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to that note, we are mixing it up today by drinking homemade wines from these two gentlemen. So while you can't drink what we're drinking today, please make sure your glass is very full with whatever boozy studs substance substance is closest <laughs> to you. <laughs> um, so Kala, I see you're in a little bit of a wine stud sandwich over there. Why don't you <laughs> yeah. I'm not mad about it. I don't think this is like appropriate for COVID, but this has been my quarantine for part of summer. So whatever they have, I probably have. This They're part of your bubble. It's they like are it. part of my bubble. Yeah. yeah, but I thought it would be kind of fun. We needed some more wine studs for this round of episodes and they're both home winemakers and wine industry professionals. So we thought it'd be kind of fun to bring them on. So I don't know who wants to go first. The two you talk about your experience in the industry, kind of where you started and what you're doing now. Well, for me, I, I was kind of on the grassroots of it. My grandfather owned a couple of restaurants. I kind of grew up into the restaurant industry. Uh, he had a farm. So kind of going out and like harvesting, you know, uh, vegetables and fruits and animals like that was just kind of what we did. And on top of that, he was also a wine fanatic. And that with every great meal that he prepared, we'd always uh, be accompanied by, you know, something that he would pull out of the cellar. At the time, I kind of took it for granted. But as I got a little older and started like serving, uh, I certainly kind of gravitated towards it, not only as a way to kind of make more income, but also just because I wanted to wanted that knowledge and to learn as much as I could, because I had that instilled passion with just like pairing food with wine. So yeah, awesome. that's, and, uh, and you're located in California, Josh? Tucson, Arizona now. Yeah. Okay, you are now. Okay, gotcha. And I started kind of like a lot of people um, in college. I worked as a server up in Flagstaff. I was going to school at NAU at the time. Served, did the, the standard kind of serving job. Learned a lot about wine up there at a, at a restaurant uh, I was at. And um, also my folks ended up about the same time uh, moving to California to some family land when my grandmother passed away. Planted a vineyard. <laughs> And uh, they've been making wine in California since about the early 2000s. So I think 2001 is when they planted their vineyard. Um, obviously, when they started making wine and growing grapes, I got much more into it and uh, just kind of started following uh, the process through them. And then actually turned that into a, uh, a career. Now I have a, a local wine bar here in Tucson called Rebel. And uh, yeah, so still get to play with wine, but also sell it and purchase it and just kind of play around with the world. Awesome. Lots of wine. I like that. <laughs> yeah. And all we've done pretty much all of quarantine is drink mostly just a lot of wine together. That's really all there is to do. <laughs> it might kill COVID just as well as bleach. You never know. <laughs> it tastes a lot better. It's somehow less damaging still, I believe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Haven't tried injecting it though. So who knows? <laughs> but anyway, so obviously long time wine fans into wine since forever is what I'm hearing. <laughs> since the beginning <laughs> yeah so usually when we have guests on which has only been once before but we try to kind of do something just across the board and ask a basic couple of questions to break the ice on you too um one of the easier ones that we'll start with is just what are your favorite varietals that you like to drink uh, so me personally, I mean, I, I really do. I love nothing more than just experiencing new and interesting varietals that I've never come across before. But, you know, for my my go to classics, I, I love nothing more than uh, I love Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Like those are two of my my favorite, most, you know, they're the most diverse varietals, in my opinion, when it comes to, you know, like bubbles. And then also just, you know, uh, you know, some of the New World offerings, you know, I'm a sucker for, you know, that that classic uh, California Chardonnay that most people kind of turn their nose up at. But uh, I love it. It's my favorite. <laughs> Same goes with just like Pinot Noir, like a good old world Pinot just like sticks to sticks to my heart. And I love the traditions and some of the practices that they do over there. So, uh, yeah, that's I would say that's where my heart lies for sure you know that well um and for me i'm kind of in both because i, I really have a an affinity for the grape but also because my my folks it was their the first grape that they really got into in california was um they're growing syrah um and i i like syrah from coming around the world but specifically the northern rhone uh the more rustic styles of northern rhone syrah is kind of made in that traditional fashion for red grape and then obviously i do like a a white burgundy, I like a Chardonnay as well. I don't quite gravitate towards the, the California styles as much as Josh does. But, um, and also just the, the class. I mean, I'm a huge champagne fan yes. as well. So, mm. always. Well, everyone knows Boozy Biddies love their bubbles. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 
three nights spent drinking too many bubbles and not feeling super hot the next morning. <laughs> right. So making your own wine, like I have no idea even where to start with that. Um, like how was that going from just like enjoying wine to then trying to make it yourself? Did it give you like more respect for the entire process or? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, I think there's always that little bit of, especially if you're selling wine and you're, you know, kind of exploring wines from around the world and you're, you know, you listen to all these different processes that, that people talk about, you know, when they're selling you wine or if you're trying to sell wine to somebody else, um, just the ideas of like, you know, this is de-stemmed or not de-stemmed and crushed or, you know, aged this way or that way or whatever. So, you know, just the idea of like, oh, there's, it's kind of an experimental process and like, maybe I should try to play around with this a little bit and, and kind of see uh, what I could do with, with winemaking. So that's how kind of I got into it. Just kind of like, I don't know, I'm kind of a geek, a little hobby, hobbyist geek. I have like new things coming up all the time. So um, it just like, I kind of said, fuck it, let's, why not? So um, that's kind of how, and also with my parents having ready access to grapes, at, you know, all the time. So I just kind of made it like a small batch. So you're grapes from California. Yep. And, yep. and Josh, where do you get your grapes? Well, so I've uh, been involved in kind of almost every process of the wine, you know, scene down here outside of like harvest. So I was lucky enough to have a friend who has a winery down in Cochise County in Pierce, Arizona. They yielded like far more grapes than they knew what to do with. It was just kind of an opportunity that fell into my lap. And basically, I just uh, was told if I came down on a certain time, I could take as many grapes as I wanted. And the first person that I went to was Todd because I knew that he had that, you know, that knowledge that, you know, he you know has come up with like over the years, but also like he knew that something like me, like I wanted to kind of, kind of keep it simple, stupid. Like I wanted it to be natural and basically as like grassroots and like, you know, I don't know, not uh, as like DIY as possible because right. yeah, we weren't trying to do anything crazy or make anything just uh, other than something that we could drink and be proud of. So I believe I did see a photo of Josh crushing the grapes for his wine, yes. with his boxers. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> an added element yeah. to the spittle bug grenache. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Yeah. But it just showed, I mean, it was, I was actually really blown away and surprised just how easy it kind of was. As long as you, you know, you you sterilize anything and keep sanitation in mind, like as long as you have like the proper, you know, climate and temperatures and tools necessary, it was relatively simple. Yeah. It's just more guidance and, you know, looking after things than anything else that those are like the biggest things that I felt like mo someone who's looking to get into it kind of needs going into it. Gotcha. So. Well, speaking of the necessary tools, what are those? Yeah, it's necessary. Yeah, question. so I mean, so the old bucket. Yeah, the old bucket. <laughs> I mean, depending on the, the, the batch size that you're going to do. I mean, if you wanted to make literally just like a gallon of wine, it doesn't take much. I mean, a vessel that you can basically turn grape juice, let it kind of set. I mean, you could even do it like, you know, you hear natural, natural winemaking or native yeast fermentation. That's basically just letting juice go bad. Um, you know, it's letting the natural yeast that are in the air turn it into uh, to wine. So you don't need a ton, you know, obviously that's going to be a different style of wine than, than commercial stuff that, that we're tasting in most bottles. But um, yeah, you don't know, need much really just something like Josh said, sterilization is probably the biggest key. You, you want to keep everything super clean make sure that nothing that you don't want, like little bacteria and other funguses and, and other bad so stuff. The you know? natural yeast is just there. And so long as you keep everything, like how do you sterilize everything without killing the natural yeast? That's, that's the real trick. Uh, honestly, like, I mean, so if you're trying to sterilize just your, your vessels themselves, that's the big key. Like you don't want to have any like just natural bacteria in the vessel itself but when you add it your, your grapes and your other you know just the grapes or skins and, and stems and all that stuff um there's natural yeast in those things and they just will kind of take over and and they'll do the job for the most part before anybody else can like or other little things can and can spoil it so if you're kind of monitoring your alcoholic fermentation and you get down to a point where you know you've turned all the sugar into alcohol and then you just kind of make sure it's sterile after that and you're good to go Awesome. Do you guys do natural yeast for both your wines, or did you actually add commercial yeast? I don't remember. No. Spittlebug was natural. <laughs> Spittlebug natural. Uh, not, the, not the contour because yeah. that was the California blend. But yeah, yeah. I think my rosé, the Holon that I made this year, the 2019 Holon, was a inoculated yeast, so like a, a commercial yeast packet. Um, but I made a Movedra as well that we're not tasting today that is a natural yeast as well. So what we are tasting today is actually two Grenaches. I sent these over to Kara. Um, one's a rosé of Grenache and one's a red, um, a Grenache Noir. 
but they both make, so there's the Halone and the Spittlebug for the two people that watch us on YouTube. Um, <laughs> hi, hi, Caitlin. I know you're one of them. <laughs> um, but uh, they also have made other wines. So you had a, what was your contour? Well, that was uh, the Grenache that we had from uh, Cochise County mixed with Todd's Moved that he had. A little, little yeah. m- micro blend. So mm-hmm. a marriage of Arizona and California yeah. here. And then you had a sparkling wine you've been working on? Yeah, so the sparkling wine that I did is um, I'm kind of using the traditional method, kind of champagne method, um, turning this alone, rosé, um, did a secondary fermentation on that. Ooh. And I'm going to try to make some, well, it's made. We'll see how well it turns out. <laughs> we're still we're still aging it right now. So when you took your dry halone rosé and decided to make it sparkling, just detail like kind of the easy steps behind the process of the that. process of making that so, secondary. Yeah, so basically, like you know, all all sparkling or all champagne method uh, sparkling wines start with a base wine uh, still, and then they actually take that wine and will add um, a secondary addition of yeast and like a sugar um, solution, basically to to kind of give some food. Some nutrients, yes, please. Um, some nutrients to those yeasts to start another fermentation process, and they'll they'll crown cap it like a like a beer bottle cap on top of that bottle, and um, and basically let that that fermentation happen. So obviously, you know, most people know that the process of fermentation creates alcohol, but it also creates carbon dioxide, and that carbon dioxide is what actually creates the bubbles in, in sparkling wines. So um, yeah, so right now that wine is in its bottle, and it's kind of just aging it, it's actually gone through its uh, secondary fermentation so we're just kind of waiting and let, let the kind of all those dead yeasts and, and, the, and the, the flavors of the champagne the sludge. <laughs> sludge as yeah exactly this episode exactly on the show. <laughs> yeah all that all that uh the detritus that's left up in the bottle that's kind of it adds a lot of flavor like that toasty flavor you get it from like aged champagnes um that's kind of what it's from so we're just kind of letting it set and See what happens. Mm-hmm. So I could take a random bottle of white or rosé wine that I like and mm-hmm. put some more yeast in it and cap it and turn it and maybe That's make simple some syrup or yep. something. Yeah. yeah, a little sugar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure. You're gonna start doing that with your backyard um, port that you're gonna be making, <laughs> Kara's backyard. Backyard port's a kind of story, but in Connecticut, maybe I'll make champagne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can't call it champagne, right? So, <laughs> Kara's Connecticut sparkling wine. <laughs> we'll take off, guys. So, tell me more about the the labels and the names that you chose. So, Josh Spittlebug, where does that come from? So, the Spittlebug was kind of an interesting thing. I didn't really have anything in mind. Like a couple of things came to mind, but I kind of like uh, kind of quickly wrote those off when I was in the fields, kind of like toiling away i mean i say toiling but we were kind of all having fun like us guys just you know when todd was wearing (laughs) flip-flops and as i'm pruning the vineyard uh we would see like these clusters that would have like little pockets would look like you know uh little saliva pockets and i was like oh that's interesting and i came up to find out from my friend that 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 little bug it's like a little nymph and that's what he does to kind of create this little uh ball of you know protection around it so if you notice the label you kind of see what appears to be kind of like the little bubble uh, this, like that's his, like his, what he oh, yeah. himself, to protect himself when he's a nymph. And then he grows in to be the two line spittle bug. And that's what, uh, that's, that's kind of reminiscent of his shell that you see on the back. Oh, it's from where the, the vineyard, where the grapes were grown. Yeah, no. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> I want to know. No. <laughs> Opening up a can of worms. No, no. This is a yeah, a new world orientation here with the labels. So this was just like a fun name that I kind of I thought kind of flowed off the tongue and it was interesting. And yeah, I'm not saying that <clears throat> I'm going to carry on with the spittle bug like line or anything like that, but I thought it was a good representation of this batch. So. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And the and uh, Super exciting story about the Holon. <laughs> <laughs> It's it? literally the name of the road that my parents' vineyard is on. So, creative, yeah. <laughs> 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 get on the market in no time. Yeah. <laughs> but because, like, the, the, the poppy ish flower on it. The label. Yeah, well, that's just the rose that I pulled, literally pulled off the internet. It was like, whatever. It was a fucking. <laughs> <laughs> that had like a very, very in depth reader. But, um, I, just, I thought it was a cool, cool word. You know, um, it's not a common, you know, nobody even knows what it means or how to pronounce it. So, it's better than like everyday rosé or <laughs> There's a, a little bit of cachet. <laughs> <laughs> Try to sound cooler than it really is. So. Right. And Josh also does like marketing and graphic design. So 
a little bit more creative on his side and Todd's just like, <laughs> quick and easy. He's like, yeah. this image I can use and put some text on and he's been printing it on paper and then applying it to the bottle with milk. Yeah. And no. adhesive. <laughs> I thought you're, yeah, you're a sticker that stay on so well. I know. Now, as you can tell by our bottle being completely labeled. <laughs> But we do have lovely well, photos. Actually, that we'll the, the Spittlebug one. So I had put this when you sent them to me. I put the rosé in the fridge and I put this one in our, we have like a 12 bottle wine fridge. And last night I was going to just open them and find them again. And I'm going through our wine fridge and I'm pulling out bottles. And I'm like, where the hell is this bottle of homemade wine? Because the label, like when you just pull it out like this compared to everything else, it looked like looked just as good. And I was like, oh, yeah. oh, okay, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> At first glance, I had like yeah, I had to go through every bottle a second time to actually find the one. I'm like, oh, this is the homemade one. <laughs> but, Compared to the whole one, you're like, oh yeah, that's a shitty homemade. <laughs> I wrote down other wine labels, like for like other restaurants and stuff. So this was like a really fun project that I want to do. Like you know, being a kind of like a wine snob myself and just being wanted to appreciate the whole process. Like this was also another you know part of the process that I thought was cool, like the marketing as aspect as well. So awesome. really from like start to finish, like this is, you know, I recycled all the bottles, I picked the grapes, I, you know, you know, did all the labeling and stuff like that. Foot stomp the foot stomping. Foot stomping in his box. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna be doing in my garage to make port. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um how many cases did you guys make of each? Or how many uh, bottles? It was 100 and 130 some I planned for 125 and then we had a couple of random like we had more juice than we knew what to do with. So uh, we had to do kind of like a last minute run to the the brewery room. Get some bottles. Works, but yeah. Yeah. no, the the bottles came easy. We just went to the recycling <laughs> bin. <laughs> so we, needed, we needed new corks. It was not the issue. <laughs> like there was a couple of like the friends and family bottles are just like misfit bottles. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a gigal, like I promise. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's just, yeah but, there's always bottles in around Rebel. Um, what was the question? How oh, many cases? so yeah, so with the rosé, I actually made. 15 gallons, which is like six cases of wine, basically. And then I turned half into the, just the still rosé and half into sparkling. So awesome. I, got about three, I got about three cases of each of those. Yeah. Is it like pretty budget friendly to make wine? Like, would you say if someone wanted to start from scratch and either had grapes that they got from a friend or even ordered grapes online or juice online, it's pretty easy to do. Is it yeah. a pretty low cost startup? Like you need some buckets some sanitizer, bottles, corks? Like yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a lot of hobbies. I mean, you can you can do it. A bunch of different ways. I mean, if you want to just do bare bones, you know, bucket, you know, literally a five gallon bucket, of, you know, pick up the, at the grocery Depot. store. Um, and grape, you know, if you have local grape sources, that's perfect. If you actually you can buy juice from online companies and make grapes or make wine out of that, um, that's pretty easy too. I mean, if you start getting into things like, you know, French oak barrels to age your wine in and, and, and things like that, it, obviously the cost is going to go up. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a few, a few, you know, Costs like bottles and corks and you know whatever, but you don't have to do you don't have to do labels, you don't have to do capsules, you don't have to do like a lot of things. I mean, you'll definitely need bottles and corks, and that's about it. Yeah, and you can recycle yeah, and recycle stuff. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. you save thirty six bucks on twelve bottles yeah. if you just kind of keep whatever bottles you have <laughs> from the night before. Yeah. <laughs> and if you do super old school style, you just put it in a vessel and like a big tub or a thing and just. Pull your nightly wine off of that. Yeah. Like a keg of it. <laughs> a keg of wine in your Not mad about a keg kitchen. of wine, personally. A keg of wine. It's always good. It sounds dangerous, though. Especially for me, I know. Because I'd be like, oh, I don't know how much is left in here. And like three days later, the entire keg would be gone. <laughs> <laughs> Must finish this. <laughs> do, do you want an intermission for our second question, Kella? <laughs> oh, yeah. So let's be like a little bit more fun. Tell me your guiltiest pleasure when it comes to drinking and keep it to drinking. I don't want to know what demons you guys have. <laughs> <laughs> Not when you're between them. Uh, well, yeah, I feel a guilty pleasure. Everyone in the wine industry kind of gives me a hard time for loving like my, my Napa Chardonnay. But, Your cougar juice? Like, yeah, my cougar juice, like California <laughs> Central Coast Chard. <laughs> but I just like cheap beer. Like I love, I love drinking slamming Coors Light Modellos and I don't know. That's yeah. like, I, like I, I appreciate craft beer. I love it. I do drink it. But at the end of the day, like I just want to, you know, slam Pilsner. six beers and yeah, a nice rice pilsner exactly. goes a long way in my heart. <laughs> PBRC fancy, yeah. really. Uh, for me, I would say I don't know. Lately, I've been on a summer kind of drinking kick of just like 
simple, like the Portatonicos are always great. I mean, I don't know if those are guilty pleasures. No, they're not like, really. We had those on an episode recently and it's yeah. kind of a nice cocktail. It's a nice cocktail. <laughs> I mean, the thing is like, I'm not guilty about any of the things I drink. I mean, like shitty sparkling wine. I mean, we picked up a, a bottle of Trader Joe's Blanc de Blanc the other day. It was pretty mm-hmm. fucking delicious. <laughs> <What>? um, <laughs> Trader Joe's has a, a Blanc de Blanc French sparkling wine and it's like $5.99 a bottle. I believe it. I used to go to the, is it the Trader Joe's wine shop? Like, and you can get, I used to get this Chardonnay for like $4. Yeah. <laughs> little sailboats on it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> But I'd say I would say ultimately it's probably like an Aperol spritz. I would say it's like a guilty pleasure because like it's pretty it's pretty Another tough. To get. Classic cocktail. <laughs> I mean, it's a classic, but like it is kind of funny to like you know when somebody's like order a round of drinks, I'll take I'll take a spritz please, and just, you know, it's like a little funny. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> is it because you're just masculine? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this beer does not scream Aperol spritzes. <laughs> I think my guilty pleasure still stands from last time. I just like my, my Miami vices and strawberry daiquiris. Yeah, I, I love those too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I still also love the the whiskey and the Starbucks um, pumpkin spice latte. So mm-hmm. very amazing. Although you were the one in college, I think that turned me on to Malibu Bay breezes. No, not me. Oh, you should. <laughs> 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 Shit, who was it then? Oh. My like classic young person going to drink too much drink, which I actually had had too much of by college, so you wouldn't have seen me do this, but it was absolute vodka and orange Gatorade. Oh. I thought this was a really great, like, stamina-friendly party drink when I was in high school. From your boarding school days? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Also a good way to get vodka into the dorm. (laughs) (laughs) Just hydrating, I swear. (laughs) Back to wine. I mean, I'm curious. I mean, it seems like both of you ended up with Grenache by virtue of it was what was easy to source. I mean, is there anything else that sort of drew you to that grape in particular? Uh, it's a it's a pretty easy grape to work with in terms of like it doesn't have any th- any characteristics that are overly one way or the other. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of preconceived ideas about like we're trying to do like a Cabernet or you know like in the red wine realm like Cabernet Cabernet Franc like all the Bordeaux style wines. Um, you know, it's much tougher to like to nail that style. Um, geez, cow. It is. <laughs> it's boozy bitties. You're supposed to get drunk, and that way, don't be pouring for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I have finished my first class. I'm moving on to my second class. So. Good, good. <laughs> um, but what else? Yeah, but Grasha has like a lot of different styles. I mean, there's the Rhone style. There's the California style. They all kind of are just kind of good wines that aren't super one thing or another. It's just, just kind of nice, good everyday drinking wine. So I dig them for that reason. Plus you can make rosé out of them. You can make red wine out of them. Um, have you noticed any difference between the Arizona Grenache that you got and the California Grenache that you have? Is there been pretty similar? Are there any like I mean, different I, taste profile things that are different? I know you made two different styles, no, but just. I mean, depending, I mean, when you think of, I mean, even some like the Grenache, we have, like the, the vineyard that I source my grapes from, roughly around 4,900, like, you know, elevation, you know, like, so it's uh, pretty similar to what you kind of get with the Cote de So like, that's why he, you know, at this vineyard, he was doing Grenache, Petit Syrah, Moved. So uh, those kind of things like worked well over there. I know James at Rune, like his Grenache is amazing. I've only had a handful of Arizona yeah. Grenaches, but yeah. it's still very kind of quintessential Grenache. It's yeah. through forward, it's light bodied. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's same, I, I would assume much goes, I yeah. Mean, yeah. I would say that I'd say the main difference that I saw, and it wasn't so much geographical, it was more just like vineyard style, or maybe not even style, like the vineyard that we pulled this one out of for Josh's wine. Um, like Josh said, they it, it was through circumstances outside of con, you know their control. Um, the vineyard was a little bit overproduced last year, and that's why they had so much grapes. Um, not super well managed because of, like I said problems so that they're, they're not vineyard they wasps related. And yeah, yeah, just, they, yeah the weeds got away from them and they, they kind of gave up on like a section of the vineyard which is why we got it or josh got it but um it was just the the grapes themselves were just a little bit overproduced so there's a lot of a lot of berries that were a little underripe um so it's probably a little lighter in style than i would or a little more you know acidic in we style. Were, i mean we did whole cluster fermentation yeah. and stuff like that and we were really selective with what yeah you know, bushels we were grabbing yeah. you know so you know it was we were getting the cream of the crop we right. turned over a lot of things but i mean i would think that i mean this is it was 
yep. the fruit was still very was well. Really, yeah, yeah. And that's it. It'll be what was that? It's September. You September. Know? This is like, almost a, yeah, about a year old already. So. Yeah. Mm. So, and which is pretty late for Arizona. Like in fact, I just saw some of these Instagram story yesterday where they were already harvesting some white wine um, down from from Wilcox, and you know it's August. August is there 7th, a lot of wine in Arizona? Is that where Gruy is from, or is that Gruy is New Mexico? Mexico. Oh, okay, yeah. so. Yeah. Arizona, oh, any big so massive, I don't know, or is it? They're also in New Mexico. Even. Yeah, so Gruet yeah. grew so much that they are not even New Mexico sparkling wine anymore. They're just American because they're getting grapes from like California and New York. Oh, it's got too they, big. Yeah, they got too big to handle what their actual vineyards were in New Mexico. But as far as Arizona wineries, I mean, doesn't that guy from Tool have a winery here? That's yeah. up north. That's up north. north. Yeah, okay. the Maynard, Maynard doing his thing with. Uh, uh, yeah. There's Caduceus. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, I wouldn't say there's anything famous from Arizona other than the tool guy. Plomsky, What's the name of the tool Springs, guy and stuff? Yeah. <laughs> the Caduceus. tool guy. The tool guy. Yeah, what's his name? Merkin Maynard. He does that whole thing as well. James Maynard. Maynard James Keenan. Maynard James Keenan. Maynard, Maynard James, James Keenan from Tool <laughs> has a winery in northern Arizona that I think would be the most well-known around the country just because he is a a he did a documentary, Blood into Wine, and kind of t- spoke on like his whole like you know what he went through to try to get a, a you know a winery going in one of the toughest regions to do so. So uh, I mean that's good, but I think what we're doing down south uh, in Arizona is I mean yeah. right up there with what they're doing, yeah. honestly. I mean, also he named one of his wines Merkin, which is a vagina wig. So that's interesting. I actually knew that. I didn't need the definition. I just, I'm, Kara, I the thought, audience. I the thought audience. you knew, but I'm just worried about our listeners. Some of them might be a lot classier than the four of us. <laughs> Although because knowing wine. Merkin's really classy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's interesting though. Um, but this is something I actually, Kelly, you mentioned in one of our earlier episodes that Grenache is actually being planted less around the world. Like it's decreasing by volume. I think it is. I think that was the episode we were talking about, Grenache. I could maybe find the, the stat, but I think that's, I mean, it just seems kind of like peculiar to me that like it's decreasing. Yeah, in the 1970s and 80s, the worldwide acreage of Grenache was closer to 800,000 acres. This is wine folly. A size with the potential to produce up to 2.5 billion bottles. The reduction of acreage is partially due to the recent spurn of low quality wines, which are produced with high yield grapes like Grenache and Chinso. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I would. I mean, arguably, would you grow more Grenache just to blend it anyhow? Like, how many people are really drinking? Yeah, well, I think for a long time, probably you know, especially with Southern France being like kind of the bulk wine producing region, um, it's huge down there. And yeah, it grows. I mean, honestly, the reason that it was so well planted, I mean, and I can speak to it, and, and, and even in Arizona, it grows very, very easily. It, it grows well. I mean, like. You can basically just stick a Grenache vine in the ground, leave mm. it alone, and it'll produce more freaking grapes than than you really. I'll try to grow it next year in Connecticut then. <laughs> 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 but so like so the secret of the Grenache is really like managing like pruning back, you know, taking off some of the the crop load off those, so you don't end up with like just really basic simple, you know, the fruit the fruits themselves like a little more complex, but. <laughs> Josh is taking a photo. Trying to low key take a photo. <laughs> yeah. So, as far as Grenache being like a relatively easy grape to grow and then seemingly make wine from, it's just not ashamed shape anymore. Um, would there be good starter grapes or juice for home winemakers that would be easier to make a wine from that would be? palatable and enjoyable versus something that's just not worth it if you have no experience in wine making being like pinot noir being my favorite my favorite varietal i wasn't trying to you know oh i would just absolutely love to make an arizona pinot noir i know (laughs) some people are doing it and it just it goes against my better judgment (laughs) so like yeah i I would say the best thing you can do as a as a as an up-and-coming home winemaker would be you know get get good fruit whatever way whatever it is that you can get the best ingredient it's like making a dinner like cool just because you want to make you know fresh seafood if you live in some place that you can't really get fresh fish yeah probably stick to what you can get locally um yeah i mean if you have access to, to grapes that are nearby that are high quality or even decent quality like go for that even uh, if even if that means maybe making a wine that you like if you're a big bordeaux guy or a girl uh, if you can only get pinot then yeah you're probably make pinot that's probably a better option than getting subpar cabernet just because you want to make cabernet or whatever so that's my, my recommendation. You get the quality of fruit first because you can't make, it sounds cliche, but you can't make good wine out of 
shitty crepes or shitty ingredients. Uh, I want to make a cotton candy grape. I want to go, <laughs> want to go to my local grocery store. Oh, yeah. I want to get some cotton candy grapes. <laughs> so there's actually all, all kinds of YouTube videos that I've, I've gone down rabbit holes of watching people make homemade wine out of like Welch's grapefruit or yeah. Welch's grape juice and like all kinds of like pretty, pretty oddball things that apparently you can still make wine out of. So start there, I guess. Do you want some spittle back more? Yeah. Well, that's what we were joking on an episode recently is like the Niagara grape from the East Coast where Karen and I are originally from is like what they used to make Welch's white grape juice and Concord is Welch's red. And my old winery used to make Niagara grape, or like Niagara wine. And it's like Welch's for adults because it'll get you drunk, but it'll mm -hmm. taste just like Welch's. But just because you could didn't mean you should make it. They make wine in Connecticut. I haven't had it, but I've seen the vineyards. <laughs> every state in the U.S. has a wine. You yeah, can go every, and taste. Even every Alaska. state. Even Alaska. I think we should go on a 50-state tour when we're allowed to travel again. Oh, we should. There's actually, yeah. close to where I am in Connecticut, across the border in New York State, there's a vineyard called Millbrook Winery that makes a decent white. They make a bunch of things, but only the white that I can't remember what it is now. I've enjoyed. So we can go around and just... Find the things that we like. I think me and you in a camper van for like three months, just winery get, to winery. Get some sponsors. Boozy bitches. Boozy bitches. <laughs> 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 <It's coming. laughs> Sponsored by the Todd and Josh. Lounge. <laughs> 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 Lizard Lounge. Great. <laughs> so have you guys ever seriously like fucked up making wine? Like just you, oh, yeah. you just like, we're like, this is, I can't come back from this. Just dump this thing. What are your, any failures that you've had making wine? I mean, I can't really talk to this because my, first two ventures are easy because I had the brilliance and guidance of, of Todd to yeah. show me the way. But, I mean, it was, it was a gamble. Like I can yeah. really imagine how deflating it would be to like have all that just go to absolutely nothing. Yeah. I, I've had, I mean, it's tough because like every, every vintage, every, every wine that, that I've made so far has had like certain things that I don't love about them. So it's like, ah, is it worth dumping away just because I don't prefer it? Or it's like a small little characteristic that I don't like. But I had one rosé last year that it got a little oxidative something. I don't know. It, it just spoiled, basically. But didn't and this rosé really evolved a little bit as well? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and they do. And, like, that's the thing about about a natural product is, like, yeah, it's going to change over time. So, so sometimes you kind of wait it out and see, like, hey, is this just a, you know, an immature kind of little flaw that, that'll, that'll change? Or, you know, it's just like a little... Sulfur, you know, as you're adding sulfur, is like uh, sometimes they can be too sulfury, and you're like, oh, it'll, it'll burn off over time. Who knows? Um, so you just kind of wait. It's like, I guess I don't have children, but I think it's like kind of that thing. Like you can't really just say like, oh, I don't like this wine. I'm gonna <laughs> dump it down the drain. It's still kind of your wine. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <just wait. laughs> well, you're not gonna get it. Right, I feel like this one doesn't. <laughs> 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 I mean, Kara is a mom. Josh is a dad. I'm sure they can attest to that sometimes. Sometimes you want to throw them back. <laughs> Take them back in the oven. <laughs> well, I, I know. <laughs> Got that out. It was a lot of work. It's not going back in. <laughs> not going back in. Yeah. But that's why we have wine, though, because when they don't sleep, and she, mine just actually passed out. I can see her on the camera at 9 p.m. But... She um, was in vacation mode last week. I saw her drinking on the beach. I mean, I'm sure it was just water, but she had that yeah. cup. Oh, but she, if you're not, that's why I have to give her decoy drinks for everything. Cause if you're not watching, she will grab an alcoholic drink and in two seconds, it's like. Teaching her young. I like her. this. I'm very yeah. proud of my goddaughter right now. Yeah. I know. She'll, she'll be ready for you, Kella. <laughs> <laughs> the cool aunt that gets her tattooed and like takes her to bars. Yep. She needs mm -hmm. one of those. Yeah. <laughs> So the last question from the basic interview questions that we give to just the one other person before you guys, um, your worst hangover story. Uh, Vegas bachelor party. It was, we were there for 48 hours. I'm pretty sure like we stayed up for 36 of it. And then like, yeah, we, it was so bad. Like they rented out like this little, little shuttle that would pick us up and take us back to the airport. And while we were on the shuttle, we were like getting like laced up with like IVs and stuff to kind of like bring us back to life because it was, I mean, I've never been, I can't, I was like looking back and it's like, I did not consume water outside of an ice cube <laughs> for at least 24 hours. That's always the killer, isn't it? You look back and you're like, you know, the alcohol is the problem, but I also never drank any water. Like, yeah, right, yeah. Dude, yeah. 
It's 120 <laughs> degrees in Vegas, <laughs> sweating the day away. Yeah. Hydration, who needs yeah, it? Yeah. All my hangovers were like, oh, yeah, I didn't eat at all. Oh, Extra. yeah. Yeah. Weird. Um, what was mine? I think my, I have, a, I have a couple probably that would qualify, but in my mind, I think my worst hangover was when I was, I probably wasn't even 21. My, my brother and his current wife uh, got married in Cabo San Lucas. Um, so the whole family flew down to Cabo and he had, it wasn't like a rager bachelor party because like the whole family was there, but we went out pretty hard the night before the wedding. And for some reason, oh, I think for some reason my parents were even like a, uh, well, it's later in the story, but so yeah, so we went out hard. Um, and I was, I don't think I was 20, I was probably like 19 or 20 years old. And we're going to all the Mexican bars where they just, you know, oh, it's a bachelor party here, tequila, 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 all night long. Um, I ended up at the Giggling Marlin at some point puking in one of the Corona, like buckets of beer. Oh ah, yeah. Just yeah. like right in the bucket, like the whole, whole table full of beers. And he's like, nope, that's where I'm going to puke right now. <laughs> um, did that. And the guy, a little, little like server guy comes over and he's like, he's like, you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. He's like, he looks in there. He's like, oh, he's like, another bucket of beer. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, so the hangover was like, for some reason, my parents decided to do like a freaking timeshare tour, like at 8 a.m. or the next day. And it's like, this is in July in Cabo, which is not super cool. Um, so I'm like on a Mexican like tour bus thing. It's like a million. What degrees. were you going to get? Like if you like, I don't know. I don't know why they, I don't even know why they did it. It was like a buffet excursion. It was, it was absolutely like insane to me. It was just a yeah. yeah. And yeah. at the time I was like, I was like, I will just like, Why ride. am I even here? Like, I don't need to be here. There's a hotel back at the hotel. Like I could just be sleeping. Right now. So I was like, not interested in your time. It smells like some sugar cookies. and Exhaust fumes, bumpy roads, 115 degrees. You know, I'm still sweating tequila and like literally, I, get, I just lay down in like some grass patch and just start puking in the on the tour and I'm like, oh, he's you guys are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure I've had worse hangers not, but that one just like sticks in my memory for like just everything bad. You feel yeah. so much more vulnerable when you're in a foreign <laughs> <Yeah>. country. <laughs> Anyways. Todd has been known to fall asleep in his own bar and wake up the next morning. So like like dapper dressed though. Like yeah. brush build. <laughs> Like, well, I was yeah. gonna say maybe that, like <laughs> could have been, but it wasn't a bad hangover. It was just you just kept drinking. It was just bad. Adulting. You rallied really well. It was yeah. bad adulting more than anything else. I mean, all things considered, 2020. I think you started the year <laughs> yeah. off too <just> far. <laughs> <laughs> well, what other reason is there to own a wine bar? I mean, really? Yeah, I mean, I can't help it. It happens. <laughs> No one's judging you. I'm just no, letting you know. No. <laughs> just providing more to the story, having known yeah. you for a little bit. Wearing a crushed velvet jacket for two days straight. <laughs> Sleeping in it. Sleeping in a, in a bar stool. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, Did you have the ottoman? Did you use like, a little ottoman? Did you no, have ottomans in those, those, No, those oh, were That's why he oh, built wow. the ottomans. That's why he built the ottomans. <laughs> so you could sleep comfortably at his bar. Sorry to your audience for all these inside jokes, but... If you ever come to Revel, downtown Tucson, we got you'll understand. <laughs> you yeah, will understand. All right, everyone has to go to Tucson now. <laughs> you'll yes. have to come out, Kara. I mean, it's hot as balls right now. We just got plane tickets to Miami for $26 round trip, so I'm sure I'm to Miami, Kara? <laughs> yeah. Where are you going to Miami? It's like the hot In November. Okay, I hope they I figure mean, it out. be like gone. I mean, that's the thing, though. It's like, why not? It's like, if we don't go, it's we lost $26. If we go, like, great. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so I could. Is that just you and Tiago? Is that with the baby as well? What is that with the baby as well, or is you and Tiago? No, only with the grandparents. Here? Gotcha. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I have a question sure. about the wine. If I were to try to make a wine, or to my new plan to make champagne, since I like it so much, and I mm. can't just buy it all the time, so just make it in my basement. Where do I find the instruction manual for this? Is there any go-to source or book that is a good home winemaking? Like, thing? where did you learn? Like, how did you just like, I mean, I know there are like common knowledge, like you add sulfur and things like that, but like. There's actually a couple of pretty decent books. I forgot, there's, what's it called? I, there's one that I read a long time ago, and it's been a while since I've, I've looked at it, but I think it's just called like home winemaking or the home winemaker or something like that. And it's winemaking it's, for it's, dummies. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's like I said, there's, it's pretty simple. I mean, there's other than like the couple of additions you have to do, like for some sulfur, 
just to protect it. Um, otherwise, I mean, it's it's really pretty basic, and like you can, you know, you can just like, talk, to, talk to anybody who knows how to make wine or even like has made wine before. And, they can help you out. If you go to your local like brew your own brew store or something like that, a lot of the times they'll have like little kits as well. You can go like make your own little thing and it won't be as, yeah. as you know, as much fun as is harvesting yeah. your own grapes yeah. and, you know, but you can still, you know, use some concentrate and like, you know, do little yeah. things. But there's actually uh, little packages. I, mean, I think, yeah. I think the first little thing that I got from my parents for like a Christmas gift, like way back in the day, um, you know, you get a box and it's, full, it's kind of like a beer making kit or a, it's like a homemade winemaker's kit. It has like a bucket and a, a couple little measuring you devices. Just follow a recipe. And yeah. So it's it's pretty simple. I mean, and really, like I said, it's if you understand the concepts of what you're doing, you're turning grape juice into alcohol. It's just kind of paying attention to it and just making sure you don't screw it up more than else. And temperatures, temperature and sanitation are the real the real tricky things. You need a, a pretty cool, you know, literally a low temperature area to do it in. Like I wouldn't do this in a garage in, in Tucson right now, but um, you know, if you're in Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, but you should be good year round over there. Um, we have a good basement. We can do it. <laughs> yeah. Basement would be perfect. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna start. So, the East Coast has basements. That's a nice thing. Right. Yeah. Back to back. Oh, I forgot. You guys are all earthquake, right? No basements, no stairs. Hmm. Why are winemakers so attractive, guys? I think it's our uh, kind of. That's what I you blame get, my I, parents. Yeah, I don't know. I asked two boys if they have any questions that they want to be asked about this process to make them talk about something they're interested in. And their first go-to is, why are we so attractive? Why are we so attractive? Yeah, I guess it's I'm just, very it's, of you. It's why, easier why are, than you think it. Like, it's not, it's not as hard. Yeah. It's not rocket science. Like, sure, like, if you're trying to get something that's consistent over time, like, you have to, like, you know, require a certain little, like, you know, you know, know how to do that. But for the most part, if you just have the passion, you can do it. Like I was lucky and like with a little bit of know-how and you just meet the right people and then things just kind of fall in your yeah. lap. And then the second, like you have the opportunity, I seized it, took advantage of it. Next thing you know, I'm drinking my own wine. So. Yeah. That's cool. and, and, I, and I think there's a, like a lot of a uh, kind of learning curve, but also think of it as a lot like cooking in a sense, like, yeah, I mean, things will change. Like, you know, you can make a, a fried egg 10 times, in a row and probably every one will turn out a little bit different. So just that idea of like, yeah, you know, do your best and don't, don't have expectations. Let the wine kind of do its own thing. You know, I mean, every wine that I've made, I try, I search, you know, I, I'm shooting for certain goals, but they usually turn out different than I anticipate. So you just kind of let it go with how it is and enjoy it. Let it, you know, so what have you done with your cases? Are you selling them? Mostly giving them to friends and family? Yeah, What's mostly just giving away. I mean, number one, you know, owning a wine bar, I can't legally sell anything that's not purchased. Um, so I can't really sell things out of my bar. So any even selling is like be um, probably just whatever. There's only three cases, so it's not a ton of ton of wine to even go through if anyway. If you purchase Spittlebug, could you sell Spittlebug or is there like some- Well, see, I mean, Spittlebug was by kind of like donation only and it kind of <laughs> happened right when COVID like took off and yeah. like I was like, you know, furloughed and all that stuff. So I was sitting on this stuff like within, you know, anticipation to do some sort of kind of awesome like wine dinner with like local ingredients and all this stuff. And then it was like, I have a bunch of dollar bills just in the closet <laughs> yeah. right now. I need to get rid of this stuff. pay rent. So yeah, like I, I kind of opened it up to like, you know, my friends and family and next thing you know, like, yeah, people were, you know, shelling out money to get bottles and telling their friends and stuff. I have like, you know, a, a couple more that I want to give out for, uh, you know, Christmas presents. But outside of that, like, yeah, I, I love that it was just sort of like a boutique blend. And yeah, that was, that's its little moment. Now it's done. I get on to the next harvest season. <laughs> awesome. So our last thing that we do for guests is we ask you to think of two truths and a lie because hopefully Karen and I can figure you out throughout this podcast to see if we can determine which one is which. I'll figure out Todd's and you figure out Josh's. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. So Todd or Josh, who's ready to go first? Because I've been prepping them for like a week being like two truths and a lie. And even like <laughs> on the walk over to this place where we're recording at, they're like, oh my God, like one lie and one truth. I'm like, I know, not how the game works, guys. Not how the game <laughs> works. <laughs> a lie. We can't just fit it, fit it. Coin flip it. One of you, do you right, rock, paper, scissors, or roll? Okay. I'll, I'll take the stage. Uh, okay, so I was a, uh, a, a nationally accredited Eagle Scout. I achieved every single merit badge that there was to be had. I had the whole the whole lot. You you want flair? I had it all. Um, I, I would say the other thing that I would did, I, I was uh, arrested in 
arguably the final resting place of Mary Magdalene at the Louvre in France. Um, I was taken to the bowels of the Virgin Megastore where I was held against my will until my grandparents uh, <laughs> came and got me out uh, from the tour that they were on. And I was bored and went and bought the Gorilla CD. I feel like it's um, way too much detail. To and, then, uh, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the second one, I, uh, I, I toured with LMFA and opened up for them on two occasions. Ooh. <laughs> so knowing Josh, the arrest, no offense, doesn't super surprise me. <laughs> Um, LMFAO or Eagle Scout. I'm going to go with you were never an Eagle Scout. I was not an Eagle Scout. <laughs> <laughs> I was like a wee below. I think that's the highest I got. A wee below? A wee below. That's a thing. I don't know what it, that means. I thought that was like an anime thing. No, maybe. Oh, that's Could a be. wee. I don't know. Oh, oh that's yeah. A, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, a wee below. Okay. <laughs> Actively involved, didn't go, didn't go the whole the whole way. Okay. Didn't cross the bridge and get the arrow. Wait, you toured with LMFAO twice, too. I just like kind of guess because you were. I know you do like some DJ stuff, mm -hmm. but I did not know that you did that. That's kind of like the biggest. I mean, at that time, like I feel it's, it's so, so yeah, name dropping LMFAO. <laughs> but at that time, that was with like they were like you know they were at their peak, their pinnacle. So it was kind of cool just cool. to relish in that. Yeah, Renaissance man, LMFAO tour person, winemaker. Marketer, okay, like wedding <laughs> DJ, graphic designer, marketer extraordinaire. Can be hired for your bar or bat mitzvah. I can <laughs> solve a Rubik's cube in two minutes. Oh, that could have been a good one for two shoes in a line. I know I say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my best one. <laughs> oh. All right, Todd. Ready, Todd. Todd. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so what did I do? So before I was a winemaker, I was also a cyclist, kind of. Uh, but I did win the state team time trial in 2013. Nice. Um, <laughs> I also um, peed in the urinal next to Carter Beaufort um, in a Scottsdale bar in 1993 or 94. For people don't, who don't, might not. I don't know. Yeah. Carter Beaufort was the drummer for the Dave Matthews Band. There you go. Just say drummer for Dave Matthews Band. Yeah. Oh, I case. forgot to yeah. go about these things. Yeah. And then, oh, and then um, actually my the name of my, the, the road that my parents live on is actually named for my grandfather, whose middle name was Maurice Halone Getzelman. That's tough. <laughs> She's thinking on it. I know. Well, it's, it's kind of, it's like you got very specific with these like year dates and then you threw in this thing when you were like, hello and had no point, but now it actually was my grandfather's. So I want to pick that one, but I also feel like there was like no date attached to that one. So it's real. So now I'm going to think for two more seconds. We'll keep drinking this middle okay. bag over here. <laughs> sure. <laughs> in our plastic cups in an abandoned bar because this is where we can figure out where to record this all together. I'm going to pick the Halone one. You're right. Oh! oh. oh. Wait, do you actually want a time trial? Yeah. Oh. Team trial. Team trial. <laughs> champion. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> and you pee next to a drummer from Dave Matthews Band? Yeah. Is that like a velodrome thing? Like a, No, it was down in like, um, like a straight like a sprint. Got to peak area on the, the road. You just go out and come back. And it's just, yeah, it's nice. team. Fast as you can. I didn't even know that. Fast as you can. So last time we did Two Reason to Lie, we both got, we both guessed to Mark and got both of them wrong. So it's nice that we both won one for yeah. once. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Also giving them plenty Apparently of time. I just come off as a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't get arrested. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> it was it was a little bit of like anger, like they they thought, I, my grandparents didn't come pick me up. They did, you know, on the tour, I, I saw David, I saw the Mona Lisa, I was over it. I went to I went to the Virgin Mega Store. They thought I stole a CD, didn't steal a CD. I just didn't speak any French at all. So like by the time I figured that out, I was like, literally, it took me to escort me to the. I'm sorry, this is a, a random tangent. This is how we go. But it's a digression we yeah, call it on this. Episode. I was taken to the shows. bowels of the Louvre, the final resting place of Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. They didn't show me that. <laughs> if you, <laughs> it's a Da Vinci Code. Yeah, okay. it's true. No, I'm just saying you didn't even be like, while I'm down here, can I see the final resting place? 
I should have asked. Well, I, like, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I hadn't read the Dan Brown novel at the time. I hadn't done it. It wasn't a hit. <laughs> Knowing what I know now, I would have asked to see the real shit. <laughs> oh man! And in oh, man. typical boozy busy boozy bitty episode, we always on a digression, and there it was. Right. We always yeah. We always just go off tangent, and then we have to bring yeah. ourselves back, and then we can't figure out how to redeem ourselves, and then we just say cheers. Yeah, and that's cheers. I think what we should do. Cheers, biddies. See you the next season. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.